Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Matt is going to talk, Callan, right? I always said Kalen, but Matt Callan is going to talk to us about how MongoDB enables your end-to-end -end data lifecycle. I'm going to say a few words about Matt here. In addition to, you're going to learn a lot, and I can say this from experience because when I joined MongoDB, he was actually my mentor, so he's really good at this. Um, uh, his that's his unofficial bio. <laughs> his official bio says he's built a career applying cutting edge technology for digital transformation, enabling enterprise customers to quickly solve near term business problems while also getting an agile architecture foundation to address future problems and opportunities. He's done this through end to end software delivery, solution architecture and account management. And most recently, he spent 10 years at MongoDB, now as an executive solutions architect, helping customers integrate MongoDB's developer data platform into their current and future state modern cloud-native operating environments and enterprise architectures. Say that 10 times really fast. That is a mouthful, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I'm gonna let you talk, but during this talk, if you guys have questions as it's going, uh, I will have the microphone and uh, he just mentioned that usually people ask questions at the end, but you could ask questions as well. Yeah, I'll pause a couple times. You'll know when they are. Thank you, Matt. Please welcome Perfect. Matt. Perfect. Okay, let's get started. Make sure my clicker's working. There we go. So with a show of hands, and hopefully I'll be able to see the hands, but how many of you have started out with an application whose architecture looked like this to start, but then later became a layer of data pipelines, glue code, and such that looked more like this with embedded charts, business intelligence, search, mobile, et cetera? How many hands here? Good, then you're in the right place. If you just worked on that simple architecture, this would not be that interesting a talk. Um, so by the end of this, you'll really know how to focus your time on new features um, using an integrated uh, data platform instead of all the time on this glue code and such. Um, and it's a data platform that's integrated with your, you know, coexisting with your stacks and ecosystems and everything that you're already used to. I spent about 20 years in enterprise technology, as you heard from Karen, about 10 years uh, at MongoDB. So happy to be your guide on this kind of short journey we have today. So straightforward agenda. We'll talk about challenges with managing a lot of those data pipelines on the last slide, where MongoDB can help, and where it might not be able to. We're going to go a level deeper uh, than maybe Andrew's talk. The vision sounds great, but we really want to vet at a lower level, does it solve 100% of your problems or just uh, you know, a smaller percentage? and then talk about, uh, summarize the benefits, and then wrap up. And uh, like I mentioned, I'll pause a couple times after uh, the app level workloads, and then uh, a bit throughout for Q&A. So looking at challenges today. So if you look at on, the, on your left-hand side, um, within an application team, you might have multiple workloads that you want to satisfy. So you have your application database, then maybe you're using MongoDB, but then you might have embedded charts or in-app analytics. You might have business intelligence and reporting, search and mobile. And then we don't just stop there. Your end-to-end -end data lifecycle is more than just that. It, your data goes into your kind of company-wide reporting and such. And so we're going to take a look at each of these workloads and where Mongo's data platform applies. Now, it was super easy for me to put all of this on one chart. So that architecture you know, looks easy to draw. But there's a lot that's behind each of those arrows. Right? There's at least five elements of work that comes with each of those arrows. So if you spread your data out into multiple products, you have to learn each product, obviously, and its best practices. You have to do the initial configuration and the ongoing management of that product. You, of course, have the data pipelines to synchronize the data, which itself might be another, data, uh, another product to learn, to transform and aggregate the data between those data sources. And then you have non-functional requirements. How do you scale each of these products that you might choose? How do you make them highly available? How do you do security? Hopefully not a you know, different way across all the products, but how do you unify the security? And then you might have data consistency challenges. Is the data in sync across all of the, those data sources? Um, where did the data come from? What, which, you know, when I'm looking at that data, do I know that I can rely on it? Because ch there might be challenges of data lineage. Do time dimensions line up across those systems? So every time you introduce another product, there's really a lot of work that can come with that. And I looked around the web for understanding what is that impact. I didn't find something conclusive, so I thought I would pull the audience. So in a second, I'm going to ask you to hold up a certain number of fingers for how many months. And the setup is this. Imagine you spend one month building a minimal viable product for an application. 
something you can get your head around and, and it's pretty easy to understand. How many more months does it take to put that data on a mobile device, do search, do business intelligence, do all your KPIs and like embedded charts and analytics? So the show of hands, how many more months you know, might that take? So I'm saying five, five, five or 10, I saw a 10 there. And the point is, even if it were three, but especially if it's five, it makes a meaningful difference. It moves the needle if you could minimize separating that data out into multiple products and solve it with a platform perspective. Uh, even if it's not all of your data, but if it minimizes it, you know, it really does move the needle. And that's why, we're, you know, why I'm doing this talk today, basically. So those are the challenges. And let's talk about how you know, where MongoDB can help. And as a recap, you know, hopefully you saw, uh, I actually don't know if this was in the keynote, but you know, hopefully you've seen uh, an intro of our developer data platform, but I'll quickly summarize it if you haven't. Um, it starts with the document model. That's always been the bread and butter and, and what MongoDB is known for. And if you think about it, it's actually a superset of other data models. A relational model, for example, is a flat document with linking between them. And you can actually model them in Mongo. I don't recommend it. I do recommend you, you aggregate data into documents, but you can model relational to an extent. You can also handle graph models with the document model, and you can see those, those other, um, I'm gonna use a pointer over here. You can see the other uh, models, the data models on the right-hand side there. Uh, we even have time series collections in particular. And all of this is available through one API and a unified interface. And then if you look over here, you can see that we'll handle different workloads. So we've always been able to handle your transactional workloads. Uh, now with Atlas Search, we can handle kind of Google-style search experiences. We can even handle real-time analytical workloads. And I'll talk about each of these in more detail. And then there's different deployment models. You know, typical distributed applications we've always been able to handle, but with Realm's uh, mobile object database and bi-directional syncing across Atlas and Realm, you can handle your offline uh, first mobile experiences. And with Atlas Serverless, you can even handle serverless workloads. And of course, the database you get in our community and enterprise versions on-prem, and the rest of it you get in our cloud um, database across, as Andrew pointed out, uh, more than 100 regions across the three major cloud providers. And it's all with one security model across them and you know, maximum uptime across it all. So that's just a quick recap. So then now we're gonna go through each of the workloads that I, that I talked through in that uh, those web of data pipeline slide and talk about is Mongo a good fit or not for those. So the first one is, and just so you know, the clock is not going down, if anyone can reset that. Um, otherwise, I'll just do my best. So talk about pre-aggregated uh, metrics. So imagine you're using Mongo for, for CRUD operations. Maybe you run an e-commerce site and you're storing orders and product catalog and the like. Um, there's a, and you don't want to, to get your KPIs and operational metrics, you don't want to scan the whole entire database to get that, to get that data. That's not an efficient query. So there's a few different approaches to doing that. You could do a double write. You write orders, you know, you create your new orders, and then you update another collection to do counts and other aggregates. Um, another way is you might write orders, but then have what we call a chain stream or an atlas trigger, um, listening for that, and then update your counts with dollar sign merge operator or a simple update. And a little more efficient might be uh, a periodic trigger, where every minute I listen for the orders that were happening over that minute and then update my count once just every minute. Uh, and there's, you know, no matter how you do it, Mongo would be, you know, obviously an appropriate place to do that if you're using Mongo as your database already. Um, and there's various features to take advantage of for doing that. One that is interesting that makes these aggregates more efficient is what we uh, have in early access now is column store indexes. So originally our indexes have been good for finding orders and a range of orders, for example. But if you wanted to aggregate across a lot of them, they may not uh, be the best. With column store indexes, if you're gonna aggregate just a couple fields out of let's say 100 fields in a the document, they're optimized for that kind of access. So that is an additional feature that we give you that makes uh, Mongo appropriate for kind of these operational metrics. And time series collections, we have particular uh, special functionality for as well. Now we're just getting started. This is one of the easiest workloads. Very likely to use Mongo for this, but times you might consider another product are if you want to publish metrics outside of Mongo, 
it might be appropriate you publish to Kafka and use something like KSQL to do kind of streaming metrics, and maybe you wouldn't put that on MongoDB. And so this is the format we'll go through. We'll talk about features yeah, that are good for Mongo, and then you might use another product for each of these workloads. The next one is embedded analytics. Sorry, just tracking, that's going down, okay. Um, imagine you have an application and you want end users to be able to see the number of orders they had per day or per month or, or something along those lines. Um, in case you don't know, Atlas provides a GUI builder for you to be able to build a chart that you then embed with an iframe or a JavaScript SDK into your applications. And you can even build it entirely from the SDK as well. And what's nice is it's built for the Mongo query, uh, for the document model. You don't have to flatten data into SQL to build charts, and it's optimized. Uh, you know, the queries are optimized for Mongo, obviously. So a really nice fa facility for uh, embedded analytics. Now, times you might consider adding another product for this is it's, um, it's really meant for the development teams, for the people familiar with the document model to build charts. If you really need data analysts or others to um, build them who just want SQL, then charts might not be for you. Uh, the BI, business intelligence, is something you might use, and we'll get to that in, a, in another slide. Also, charts is not meant for real-time kind of every second updates, like a trading screen, for example, um, which is usually not a problem. The lowest granularity is about every minute, and with the SDK, you can update it even more often. Again, usually uh, good enough. And then there might be specific chart types Charts has many different types, but if you need, for example, a candlestick, I don't think that's in charts today. So it'll solve a lot of you know, nice workloads, but these are where you might consider adding another product. Now it starts to get interesting when you get into live business intelligence. And I call it live because you are able to do BI literally on your operational cluster. And I'll, I'll talk through this slide in case you're not familiar with the architecture. So if you see on the left-hand side, your application often would write to what we call transactional or an atlas called electable nodes. So you have nodes that are reserved for high availability. But what's nice is you can also have nodes that are deemed analytics nodes for you to hammer away at, and if you, uh, you exhaust the resources of those nodes, they don't affect your nodes that are reserved for high availability. So they're great for pointing analytics too. And we just, earlier this year, released the feature that you can scale these up or down independent of your operational nodes. So if you, have a lot of, if you have a lot of heavy analytics, you can make these nodes larger. And when you combine these with column store indexes, you additionally can support queries that are common in BI uh, and across your cluster. And if, you don't, if you're not aware, we have two different ways that you can expose a SQL interface to BI tools. So the BI connector is what we've always had. Or, or at least for many years, and it uses MySQL's protocol, so it gives you good compatibility across your BI tools. Early this year, um, but that uses the compute of your cluster. Early this year, we released Atlas SQL, which is a serverless layer where you pay per query, and that does not use the compute of your cluster, other than processing your query, and, um, and so that gives you another option for pointing your BI tools at. So this is where you do get live BI capabilities right there on your cluster, it's up to the second. In addition, we released, again in preview, data lake storage, where we take the snapshots from your cluster, and let's say they are taking it every hour, and we hydrate them onto object storage in, in a columnar format in Parquet files. And so very cheap, but also because the data is in a columnar format and we tag it with aggregated metadata, it can provide a lot of ad hoc queryability at a cheap cost for your BI tools. So this is kind of the impetus for this talk was the idea that you can use Mongo for operational, but more and more, and this is just the beginning, you're gonna be able to use it for your analytical workloads as well. I talked about most of these features to take advantage of. Uh, one other to highlight is read-only views. So you can create views in Mongo if you do need to prepare the data in a certain way for your end users uh, for BI. Now here you might consider another product, um, you know, basically good to test out that the performance is what you need. I, we're a little bit of a transition point. The BI connector is solid and it's been around for a while, but we do have a limited ability to optimize it because it uses my uh, SQL variant. Atlas SQL uses a SQL variant we control, still standard kind of SQL 92, but we can add extensions to make it perform better. Um, 
and, it, and we will you know, constantly be, because it was just early access, we will constantly improve that. So always good to test out that you know, we have what you need. And then another thing is that sometimes you need to create views in SQL because your users, you know, that's what they expect. That's not currently available. Often you can create views in your BI tool and then you can do it in Mongo as well, so that might be what you need. But good to point out when you, know, you might consider adding another product. Now turning to search. Uh, if you're like me, when I go to a website, if I can't find what I want on that first page, I go to the search bar. And on this one Yelp screen, there's many uses of search. Uh, for example, I want fuzzy matching for typo correction. I might want autocomplete to help users find what they're looking for even better. I might do faceted navigation to help you know, guide the customer, guide the user. I might do geographic search, certainly common for restaurants and, and finding retail stores, et cetera. And then it's very important I can tune the scoring, right, for sponsor results or recommended or just make it as relevant for the user as possible. And then do highlighting where I can put the search terms into the results. So Atlas Search offers all of that and more, including an early access vector search, which is kind of the next generation of search to make re uh, results more relevant with less work for application teams. Now where you might consider another product um, instead of Atlas searches, of course if the data is outside of Mongo and you don't want to put it into Mongo, of course that's a time when you know, Atlas search doesn't apply. Uh, and also we focus very much on that application search. If you do want to do log aggregation, we might have what you need, but it's not our focus at this point. And then um, we do not have an out of the box UI for business users. Often integrating search is a technical task, so that's okay but just be aware of that as well. And the last workload before I take a question is uh, for mobile. Many of you probably know the best mobile experience is when you have the data on the device. You don't have to wait for data to get round trip you know, to and from the cloud. If you don't have connectivity, like if you're in the subway or a rural area or your connection drops, um, you still have a great experience. And there are um, businesses with dozens of developers just to handle the bi-directional sync. It is not easy to build yourself. There's lots of edge cases. And what's so nice about Atlas is that it has bi-directional sync included. So you use Realm, which is one of the most popular object databases, or the, only, you know, the most popular object database for a mobile device. You use that on the, on the mobile, for your mobile application, and then you choose what data bi-directionally syncs to and from the cloud. Uh, I can't speak enough of how great that solution is, and there's experts here to talk about that in more detail. Uh, and it's built for mobile, minimum battery and network usage, and, and you can see all the other features here. Now, you m won't often consider another product, but there are times like maybe you control the network and you don't want data going over the internet. I mean, I guess could be a time you don't want to use our device sync. You can still use Realm, though, by the way. And then for very high write or daily active user edge cases, I mean, many thousands of writes a second and millions of daily active users, especially when they share the same data, it might not be a good fit, but good to talk with us because there's ways to architect for those as well. So I'll pause there, probably a little behind, but any quick question so far? Okay. Quick I'll, time check because you, you had asked, ten, ten, we got about 10 minutes. Yes, cool. I think I'm a little behind, so I'll, I'll keep going, which is good if you don't have questions. Um, so let's turn to the company level workload. So now that we're outside of an individual application team and moving into the distribution across the rest of the company. Uh, so master data is the first workload we'll talk about. And if you're not familiar with that term, that basically means shared data across your company. So customer data, product data, um, you know, any data that's in many applications across your company. And Mongo, you know, you might realize is a great repository for master data. And product catalog is a great example of that. Every product might have different fields, but the fact that in Mongo, with a dynamic schema, I can store that in one collection and then do search on top of it is really powerful. Um, and visually, you can see how that works. I might gather all of that data from source systems on the left-hand side here, and there's many options for getting the data into Mongo. Uh, I, I often see kind of a change data capture, publish to Kafka, and use our Kafka connector to load the data into Mongo. But there are batch tools and you can see other tools listed there. And the nice thing is once I get it into especially Atlas, I have many different APIs instantly available. I have an HTTP API, we call it Data API. I have GraphQL as an option. 
any of my favorite programming language, subscriptions through Kafka. So the consuming applications have many options to get at that data, plus all the flexible querying that Mongo gives you. And that's the goal, right? You want to be able to have one hub where everyone can consume the data instead of them taking a copy of master data, and then you get a lot of data out of sync. Now, I don't want to overlook, there's a lot, uh, there's a whole master data management category of tools, and especially that handle the merging rules for you. So I do, you know, want to point that out. Some of them support Mongo, some don't. I have not found many that support kind of publishing to Kafka near real time and handling master data kind of rules for you. I see customers often building that themselves, but good for you to know that that's something to consider in, in this architecture. Uh, and I highlighted some of these features. One that some people don't know about is we do offer an, a public JSON schema spec that we enforce. So you can, in Mongo, govern zero fields, all of your fields, or anything in between. And that is more and more useful as you get to share data to be able to govern your data to an extent. And like I said, you might consider another product for this if, if you really need the off-the-shelf rules and maybe that tool doesn't support Mongo. Any questions about Mongo? Um, using Mongo for master data? Okay, I'll keep going. Keeps me on time. Um, so imagine once I put all the data into Mongo as a master data hub, a lot of people say, well now I want to use it for reporting. I've put on the, all that work into the data quality, let me see if I can use my cross, you know, company-wide uh, BI reporting. And a lot of that comes down to what we just talked about. You have the BI connector, you have Atlas SQL, it's a great benefit that once you get the master data into Mongo, then you can leverage it even further, further for the real-time analytics. Now, in this case, you might consider another product. Um, now for company-wide reporting, using SQL becomes even more necessary often. So good to think about, do I need to create views in SQL? And in that case, maybe Mongo might not be the best product. Like I said, you could also put them in your BI tools and or at the Mongo query language level and then other uh, criteria that we talked about earlier. Now, the next workload is analytics. Um, and historically, you know, from an application perspective, you kind of handle your data that's in your application, and you publish it somewhere for a centralized data warehouse or data lake. Um, and the challenge, and Mongo is not typically used for that. The challenge, though, that people have been realizing in the industry is that I, um, an application is in an operational kind of line of business, and that line of business understands the data really well, but then it publishes the data to a centralized data warehouse and a centralized data engineering team who doesn't understand the data as well, because they have to support the whole company, and they're supposed to prepare analytics for the line of business who understands the data really well. So it can be seen as a mismatch. And so a trend you may have heard in the industry is what's called a decentralized data mesh is the term. The idea here is that the operational teams that own the data, their job is to productize, create an analytical data product of their data available for the rest of the company to consume. So that if you're a um, data scientist who wants to build a machine learning algorithm, you, um, at, you kind of federate your access across the different lines of business or operational domains and across those data products. But at least they're prepared in a really easy to use way by people that understood the data. And why Mongo is a great fit for this kind of trend is because you have all those APIs instantly available once you get the data into MongoDB, right? You have SQL, you have REST, Spark, Kafka, all your programming languages and everything. Um, so, you know, can be a really powerful uh, pattern, design pattern and architecture. Now you might consider another product um, other than Mongo. It really depends on if you go centralized or decentralized. If you use centralized, like I said, we can participate in that. Good to make use of the data as much as possible in the operational domain, but then you'll end up sending the data to a centralized uh, data lake type process. And then other criteria that we talked about earlier. Now this might all sound great. I I'd love to use the platform for everything, but is our customers really using it? And, and of course the answer is yes, and, and put a proof point here um, to, to give that confidence. So Keller Williams, global real estate company, and when you search for a house, um, you don't know what you're looking for, right? You literally search for it. And so they put search at the center of their um, application, and they have the data in MongoDB, and they were able to use Atlas Search just by configuring an index, a search index, to make that data available to their end users. 
And they also use Atlas triggers once they get the data into MongoDB to enrich the data further. And they're able to use charts for their business reporting. So again, they didn't have to go to other products. They could just handle this with automated synchronization. So we talked about those challenges, where MongoDB can help and where it can't, and then to summarize the benefits. It really comes down to turning these expensive arrows where there's five elements of work that we talked about before and making that automated synchronization. Where you can do that, it really will move the, na the needle at optimizing your kind of productivity. And in particular, it'll turn that, it's hard to see on, actually you see it fine up there, I don't see it well here. But that light color, if you can turn that glue code, the time that you spend on gluing everything together and managing data pipelines, if you can turn that into adding features, it can be saving some 40% and more, uh, depending on, on how often you can just use the platform versus separate products. So in closing, you know, we talked about the challenges of hopefully not having to manage all these many data pipelines, how MongoDB's platform approach can uh, often solve, if not all of the problems for you, it can certainly minimize how often you send the data to another product. And the net net is you have more time for delaying customers, which is why you're building applications in the, in the first place. So um, kind of in closing today, you know, as you leave this room, think about if you already use Mongo, taking some of your data, building a chart, playing with search. And if you don't use Mongo, you know, pull up an Atlas serverless free tier, load the sample data, and play with it that way. So thank you very much, and please do leave us feedback at this QR code. Thanks, everyone. I actually do have three minutes for questions, it looks like. So any questions at this point? So for uh, device sync, um, there was uh, one uh, condition here, right, uh, that if there are la high right edge that we should not consider device sync. You have any metrics for that? I've been guided to, this is per device, per device by the way. If it's like 10,000 writes a second per device, I think we have to think about, definitely work with us and understand if it's a good fit or not, and we have mobile experts here. But I've been guided to that, like maybe it's, you know, in that area you need to be careful. Does that help? Yeah. But I could definitely point you to, uh, Jeff is here and Tim, and, and let any of us know, and we can point you to those specialists here. Um, so I'm sorry, we can't actually take any more questions. Sorry. Is this lying? It says two minutes. I guess it is lying, but they just yelled at me to yell at you. So, uh, but he's here. You can yell at him all you want. I will be here after. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> so thank you, Matt.